All right, you guys. So a lot of people seem to think that I love politics, but I really don't, man. It's a, uh, it's a disgraceful <laughs> endeavor in any respect. Um, and uh, here's why: I'm about to shred a prime minister, a new asshole, uh, a speech that she gave. So the prime minister of Iceland at the. Um, 2018 OECD Global Anti-Corruption and Integrity something. Uh, I don't see the whole title here, but uh, I'll, I'll link all this stuff. Um, it's uh, it's really something to look at. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's, uh, let's examine some of the things that she says in her speech and uh, some of the issues that I have with it. And this is tactics and narratives and, and plays and uh, uh, wordplay. Take a deep breath. Her opening remarks, Prime Minister. Thank you, Secretary General and ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies. Well, it's uh, very appropriate to be here because you mentioned the Nordics and their sailing around the world, and Iceland was actually settled because of some Norwegians who didn't want to pay tax <laughs> to the Norwegian king, Harald with the long hair. So tax evasion has been quite an issue in Iceland ever since, actually. Okay, so right there, she, uh, she really sets the tone, doesn't she? Mm, tax evasion being kind of like a, a cultural phenomenon to Iceland. What she f fails to uh, bring in here and include in these remarks, yeah, so, uh, She's, she's right, Harold with the long hair, the F Harold Fairhair. He did indeed uh, unify the kingdoms of Norway, the small uh, petty uh, chieftain kingdoms, into, uh, into a, a whole country. And uh, yeah, he didn't do so very peacefully. She seems to leave that little fact out. There, there was a whole bunch of there were a whole bunch of wars, and he had enemies and and people who did who with whom he he wouldn't have gotten along, and they would probably uh, be more likely to wind up dead, you know, if they would have tried to join his kingdom rather than not. So there's obviously quite a bit of history there, and it's not really f just fair and honest to ignore that. Um, also, yeah, when you have that franchise, when you're empire building, yeah, you're, you're going to need a lot of funds. So you're going to demand a whole bunch of taxes. And, uh, you know, there's one thing, it's one thing paying taxes to build a good society, other th a completely different thing to pay taxes for some guy who you might perceive to be a maniac to go out and build his, uh, empirical vision, you know, his, uh, so... So, yeah, it seems like she might be uh, on the side of imperialism here uh, with the way she presents this. Also, another thing, those were all very different visions uh, competing. Iceland, when it was founded, and uh, I'll probably link that as well. There, there's information on that. Uh, when it was founded, it was founded on a very different vision. Uh, it had a parliament. It, was, it has one of the oldest continuous uh, parliaments in the world. Uh, so it had a parliament, but there was no kings, no king. Um, this was just a whole bunch of small little uh, uh, settlers and, and small chieftains and, and farmers who just claimed their lands and settled and, uh, and they all had their representatives and, and the, they then answered to the, the godes, you know, and they had uh, assembly parliament members uh, who would show up to, to talk and discuss and work out the law and disputes and everything. So it was actually, uh, it was a huge novelty, the, the uh, early day Icelandic uh, system and, and this idea, the founding principles of Iceland were uh, very much uh, a revolutionary novelty of, of its day. So those were, uh, it was innovation, there were competing visions there. So if you, if you like the Norwegian, Swedish and Danish traditions, you could live in one of those countries. If you wanted to try out something new, you could venture off to Iceland and, uh, and do that. So in, in some ways, this is also very much like uh, an early day version of the same principles the U.S. was founded upon, which also had a lot of people running away from, uh, you know, big imperialist uh, countries in Europe where, you know, they were ruled uh, with a harsh iron fist and they were just uh, in hyper expansion and, and everything. And, you know, some people just uh, didn't want to be a part of that. 
be it for the reason that they didn't like imperialism or for the free the, the reason that they just wanted to be free and, and mind their own damn business and go on about their day you know probably a, a whole bunch of different reasons and, and maybe it was because they had uh, disfranchised uh, disenfranchised their names back home and uh, needed to get out of Dodge you know that's, you can't tell but uh, if you're gonna be honest about this this is pretty much just the same as saying yeah well you know the u.s has a long history of tax evasion because it was founded by people who didn't really want to pay taxes to the uh to england or the the king of uh, king of uh of england or whatnot but while you know excluding the fact that what they left wasn't what well, probably wasn't something to idealize uh, to begin with, uh, at the point in time, so, so yes, yeah, so if you're running away from something that uh, we now look back and we see, uh, you know, we view the uh, colonial era and the imperialist era as something not necessarily uh, to to be idolized. It's, there's certainly, regardless of political affiliation, certainly a lot that we can criticize from that era. So she's. She's pretty much just uh, brushing that little notion away. Anyways, let's see uh, how she continues this. But hopefully we are moving on. Hopefully we are moving on and, and pro proceeding. I was really uh, intrigued to hear about uh, OECD's policies on education, on integrity. I used to serve as a minister for culture and education in Iceland from 2009 to 2013. Actually then, it was just after the economic crisis hit us, and we actually made a new curriculum. Part of that curriculum was education on democracy, and part of that was implementing more critical thinking and ethics into the Icelandic curriculum. Thank you, thank you. I'm a little bit smaller than you, but not. <laughs> yeah, so this guy came in to uh, lower her microphone a little bit. Uh, that's why she said she's a little bit, said thank you, and she's a little bit smaller than him. You'll see it if you watch this whole thing. So yeah, so uh, while she was uh, Secretary of Education, they uh, implemented a, a new curriculum following the crisis, etc. Well, um, I haven't dissected that, to be honest. I haven't really dived into it, whether it's uh, whether that new curriculum is uh, fulfilling its goals or whether it's completely partisan and biased and they just managed to squeeze that in. And also, we, we don't know what the results are. This is fairly new, so these kids... Uh, you know, they're they're not the, the product isn't fully out there because the kids are still going through that new curriculum We haven't seen how it manifests itself or whatnot. So so the jury is still uh, not quite out on that whether uh, whether it's uh, It's gonna render something uh, productive uh, in terms of results or not <laughs> However, uh, I think actually integrity should become part of that curriculum also and hopefully in 20 years time, we will see some results of this new curriculum in Iceland. It's going to take at least 20 times. Uh, 20, 20 I would years. like to extend my gratitude to OECD for organizing this forum and placing these matters so firmly on the international agenda because I believe them to be of Im immense value for us all. Integrity is an essential component in any democratic society. One of the fundamental values underpinning our system of governance is the public's trust as Mr. Guria mentioned, in elected representatives. The public expects elected representatives to regard their mandate as an invitation to serve only for the common good and not to exploit it for their private gain, protect any vested interests, nor to use it to serve forces aiming to undermine democracy and equal rights. You know, it's so interesting. She's talking about all of this at the same time, and this ties it back to the Daddy 2 story. Uh, at the same time, an assistant of hers in the in her ministry, so an assistant to this very prime minister, was in the leaked files from uh, that hidden Facebook group where they were uh, planning, uh, or so it, it fairly clearly seems, that they were planning to, uh, to uh, use dirty tricks to take out the hashtag Daddy2 movement and that entire case. And it had an assistant of this prime minister in the files. It had a VP of another major far left party. And uh, it had people who are in the higher ups in media. So she's uh, talking about uh, corruption and not using something for a personal gain. 
and uh and uh what else was in there so yeah um in, yeah making sure like all of that doesn't manifest itself uh in there all the while and i'm not suggesting that she herself uh isn't uh honest and true in her, her motives um uh, not at all but the fact that she has uh she's and she's you know not mentioning that here that she has to clean house in her own ministry but the fact that she has uh an assistant who's uh in the hot seat right now as we speak and, and this is from last week that that was uh that leak had just come out when this uh the speech was uh given so she's she's got an assistant in the hot seat on corruption allegations um that are and and that's not being addressed so this is uh uh, this, you know, it, it does make this a, for a little chilling effect. I I really hope she uh, takes a good look at her own uh, her own party and uh, her own uh, her own ministry or, or uh, her own office and uh, cleans her own house if she wants to. Uh, especially, you know, she mentions public trust and it's you know beautiful language she uses. Uh, you know that you have you've been granted an invitation, an open invitation to serve, and and you know that you that public trust matters. Yeah, I'm with her. I'm very much with her, and uh, and uh, I was with her when she went into this coalition. Uh, and I'd be the first to admit I have had zero respect for this politician throughout her career. I think that she's very often gotten away with some uh, cheap talking points that didn't go challenged, uh, that were very easy to bunk. And I felt like she's scored points uh, for that because she she's basically hasn't had um, skilled enough opponents or opponents who were awake and actually realized that they had to challenge her, that it wasn't as much of a no-brainer as they may have considered that she was uh, talking out of, well, uh, somebody's rear end. Uh, so yeah, I have very little respect for uh, her career overall, but when she entered into this coalition, and she's probably going to mention that later in this uh, video, that she entered into a coalition with the two parties that her party has trained its grassroots to hate. She had to because, uh, it's, well, the two towers of Icelandic politics uh, following the, the most recent election was her party. And one of those parties that, that has historically been been the biggest party in the country uh, since uh, since Iceland reclaimed its independence, and yeah, you know they're uh, they're feuding, but this is politics, and so when at some point you guys are forced to talk to each other and get along and build a coalition, then yeah, you're just gonna have to suck it up, Buttercup, and uh, that's what they were forced to do. And she and and her party, the the parliament members, the newly elected parliament members in her party, they uh, most of them went in there. Two of them uh, have sort of uh, been on the fringes of that coalition, but for the most part, uh, the the elected part of her party, they went into this wholeheartedly and knew it had to be done. There there, there had to be some government in place. And they took a hit. They lost uh, political capital. Uh, they lost voters. Some people threw a hissy fit and just ran out of the party, as you know happens. It's just my way or the highway politics, uh, which you know can only bring you disaster. So, so yeah, I was I was with her there, and uh, I called out the party members who uh, who actually uh, just just ran off and uh, and. Uh, you know, I saw this as uh, something positive for her career, for her as a politician, a positive chance for her to really grow. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I want her to grow. I want her to do well. And uh, I, I absolutely don't want her to fail. It's not in the interest of anyone in the country for her to do poorly. So I, I really genuinely want her to succeed. But that's one of the many reasons for why I'm calling her out on all of these things right now. Because uh, she's talking very... Good stuff here and beautiful stuff but she's uh excluding the reality that she has something uh going on inside of her own house that she needs to clean up and also she uh she uh talked about the uh foundation of the country leaving out the principles leaving out the details of history and basically making the founders of iceland look bad and the history of iceland look bad the uh culture and uh 
and uh, customs of the country uh, look bad and disingenuous and uh, you know saying then going on to say that that has followed us followed this country on uh, to today which uh, you know it's uh, uh, it's whether or not it would be true uh, you're when you're a prime minister you don't uh, disenfranchise your country you don't um, you don't say or do things that make your country look bad yes I mean every country has done some things well some things uh, poorly it's okay to be honest about that but to make it sound like uh, your country is just a, a collection of people of Ill, Ill intent it just uh, it doesn't fly and uh when when prime ministers uh, or presidents speak like this uh yeah it it does uh does some harm to uh a country's reputation and uh, and it does affect the people the public and uh it does change your brand your image as a country as a nation uh on the international stage it can affect uh, uh business across countries we see that all the time uh, the image of a, a country um, surely affects business across borders, it affects investment, uh, any other type of uh, partnerships, um, and your position to negotiate, not just within the business world, but also on a diplomatic level. So yeah, she's, uh, she's really playing with fire here, and uh, from the point of view of the Icelandic uh, citizens and taxpayers, I wouldn't like it one bit. The importance of trust and integrity, integrity for public office has been discussed in political philosoph philosophy since time immemorial, and many of our rules and conventions regarding public office holders go back centuries and cannot be explained without references to such fundamental values. Oh, oh, so that can't be explained without references to such fundamental values. But the opening the, the tiny little opening remark you had about uh, about Iceland, the founding of Iceland and the history of Iceland, that can surely be explained without so, such references and, and without addressing the values. It's like, come on, this is, this is, this is pure doublespeak here. This is purely uh, applying a different, uh, a different set of standards to this than the other. However, if I look at my own country, Iceland, it wasn't really until 2008 when the financial crisis and collapse of the Icelandic banks really shook our belief in a system we had taken for granted. And okay, uh, I would absolutely call her out on that. I would totally call her out on that. In what sense? Uh, you know, please argue that. She, she makes the statement and... Okay, so let's see if she does argue that and, uh, and uh, whether she does back it up. Let, let's take a look. And it wasn't until then that anti-corruption and integrity really caught some attention in the political discourse in Iceland. Before the crisis, we actually, uh, the Icelandic public really had great trust in Icelandic politicians. When we measured trust, it was around 70% trust and it went down to about 10% after the crisis. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a point to that. There, there's been a lot of trust uh, over the years, and, and that is not necessarily a good thing. Come on, there's a there's a lot been a lot of trust in uh, in Scandinavia in the system as well. Blind trust, and in Europe, blind trust. Are they better off? Are they doing all right? Is Europe in any way, shape, or form uh, better off than? Uh, the U.S., a country is, whose history really uh, has, uh, you know, this th has it integrated into itself, like the, the country that has it in integrated into itself, that uh, you should be skeptical about politics. Um, not necessarily. So, yeah, so uh, skepticism uh, might not always m make it easy for you to get things done. Granted, uh, it, it's... Uh, you know, it, it, it's an obvious barrier, you know, it, it, it is a threshold when you have skepticism of government and of authority as a part of your culture. Yeah, you know, you're going to be, it's going to be hard to overcome that to get anything done, of course. But at the same time, not having it does not guarantee that uh, you'll be any better off. Most of these big uh, tyrannical governments and empires throughout history, many of them at least, have uh, benefited from the fact that they ran on blind trust. 
the public was right there the whole way. They didn't think two cents of it until all of a sudden hell broke loose and, and everything was, uh, um, you know, up in flames. People were being either butchered by their own governments or war were raging all over the place. So, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's good to have trust, but because, just because you have trust doesn't mean you're doing something good. So, yeah, it's good to have trust, but having trust doesn't necessarily equate that things are good. So it was a very high and steep fall, really. Uh, what and happened was. really, because we are a small nation of about 330,000 people, is that we had implemented a less fair system uh, for the so-called financial Vikings, where many politicians really took on the role of cheerleaders. So alongside with the banks, the trust in public institutions and politicians collapsed. And since then, actually... And this is the, the typical narrative. So, so here's what happens when one side wins the propaganda war following... A conflict and we saw this uh, all across the uh, the Western world really in 08 the, the the left really the left the radical left really won the propaganda the war everywhere uh, and they did so pretty one-sidedly and and it's uh, it's a sad reality because uh, it means that you know because just look back everybody was involved with politics before that it's not like you had everything till 08 and then all of a sudden oh oh there's a left wing out there there was no such thing as a left wing before the left has always been there and the right has always been there and the center and the libertarian and the authoritarian all these different factions have always been present so if you win the propaganda war you can basically whitewash every bit of uh of contribution that either your side or your ideological uh position or your your values or just ideology in general Anything from any contribution from your standpoint, you can whitewash all that away, and and that's pretty much the, the case here. It's just like they uh, they just managed to pin that, and uh, they talk a lot about a laissez-faire system. Uh, okay, so so what is a laissez-faire system? People uh, and even scholars don't always agree on what constitutes as laissez-faire, and uh, in this case, you have to break it down. So, it, yeah, these um, they talk about the. Uh, these Vikings, you know, these business tycoons were called Utra so uh, Vikings who ventured out. Um, these business tycoons who went around the world. And yeah, she does make a point that there were a lot of uh, politicians uh, who actually seemed like they were cheerleaders for that. And and uh, even the, the, the reigning president at the time, they went and pioneered that to try and uh, help, uh, help Icelandic uh, creativity and Icelandic uh, entrepreneurship to really branch out. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and it has uh, nothing to do with the fact that a lot of the, the in a lot of these cases, you know, because they the government had throughout time privatized a lot, and we had been since 1994, Iceland had been a part of the uh, European uh, Economic Zone, so the EFTA agreement, and then you know somewhat tied itself into uh, co deeper collaboration with the European Union without being an EU member state. So uh, there was a lot of stuff involved that uh, enabled the country access to uh, external markets that it hadn't had before the mid nineties that enabled the country to grow. A lot of things were privatized, uh, privatized state property sold. Um, and of course, when you, you get a lot of property out on the market, then of course that can, a lot of that property can be used as collateral for loans, right? You know, you, you, you have that as a, as a guarantee for uh, the money you borrow. So you have a lot of companies also emerging and bigger companies. And so you have, and th this is the spin that uh, we've sometimes found. And I, I might be able to find uh, an old lecture on that. This has been researched to the T and, uh, and documented and talked about it, it, endlessly for the past 10 years. Um, it's now, the one thing that is holding Iceland back as a society is that it cannot get over 2008. People are so stuck in it that there's no way forward, actually, uh, in my humble opinion. But yeah, so uh, this ownership uh, spin that I'm going to, uh, or, or um, a braid, if you will, that I'm going to um, explain to you. So you have a company that owns a part share in another company. Whoops. That owns a part share in another. That owns a part share in 
a fourth one that owns a part share in, whoop, guess what? The top company. So when you have these, you know, ownership shares all over the place and, and then eventually, you know, the company on top, because it's being uh, partially owned by the, the, the fourth company down four generations down from itself, that's that ownership share is dead. So unless you trace that and you're uh, aware of that, it, it might look like the top company is very, very solid and, and firm on paper, while in actually a lot of its uh, alleged value is dead value because, uh, you know, if it, it, it owns itself. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's another one of those problems. So a lot of these companies managed, and, and not just companies, but, uh, but the banks are, are involved in this as well. And, and a lot of their enterprises managed to borrow because it looked, they looked so good and strong and robust on paper. And then when it came down to it, there was really no collateral. And uh, if the bank doesn't do that job properly and they just lend out and lend out and not just to companies and, and but also to individuals, there's a lot of uh, even the lower classes just consuming, 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 you know, mo modern monetary theory on steroids. And if you constantly lend out like that and, uh, and you're doing bad banking and the public the is, you know, obligated by law to vouch for the bank so the, if the bank fails the public purse the government has to come in and bail them out which by the way um iceland went the opposite direction on that and uh, not in the way that a lot of people uh, abroad would like to retell that story so there are a lot of de details on that but you know uh, in certain ways it, it did do a different approach than most countries but still uh, how, how can you talk about what's less say fair when you have um a government that backs up the banking system, that backs up the uh, the entire enterprise and the uh, and the corporate world and everything, and then you have them acting irresponsibly, and you you can't really say that there was no such thing as an SEC equivalency in Iceland because Fjormo left it were there, they had their protocol, they were working accordingly. Uh, it just uh, still didn't help. Uh, it, it didn't help people catch what was going on. So, so yeah, there was a whole bunch of people really sleeping there. But to insinuate that there was some kind of a, a system that um, there was certainly a system that enabled them to behave in this way. Uh, but to call it less fair, well, you have to first uh, uh, define what less fair is, and uh, the left hasn't really done that. They just managed to pin this on something that they can say was a trend of someone else and it had nothing to do with any of the things that they got through because I'll, I'll hand one thing to the Icelandic left and to the left in general in the Western world this is something to their merit uh, they've been very good uh, at getting things their way and getting their policies and ideas through even when they have not been in power even when they have been uh, in opposition, they've found every single dirty trick in the book to get everything, uh, they, as much of what they want to get through, get it through. And, you know, that's uh, good politicking. But you can't then turn around and say, no, we never got anything, so we had no business in, uh, in doing any of this stuff or what. And the same goes for the right. If, if the right uh, get, would get anything through, which the right hardly ever gets anything through. It's... Uh, it's uh, the actual like the small government right is the most inefficient movement or or type of of movement that could ever come uh, ever emerge in politics because they uh they suck at politicking uh, they they uh really love to get things uh get things factual but to actually get things through and get them passed uh, no they suck at that and being organized uh, to get things passed no they suck at that as well uh, it's a tragedy for the right wing voter or, and or and then I'm talking in the traditional sense not the uh not the uh yeah uh, what what so way to call it uh, I think people are probably calling it far right or alt right or whatever they call it not in that sense uh these those people might might get things through and might not I don't know but uh but the the, the small government uh Liber libertarian or liberal leaning right you know, the uh the the more let's say fair or live and live type of right uh never really does an awful lot in politics yeah they can 
they can manage to build a platform and uh, get some sort of an agenda going and, and get through and get into some powers, but they hardly ever rock the uh, institutional behemoth that is uh, the government, the public sector structure. They hardly ever rock that. And uh, if you just uh, strip everything off of funds and you don't um, restructure or streamline something, it's, uh, you know, it's, and, and this is why, also why austerity is falling out of grace, because uh, a lot of people take it as, oh, austerity, that just means we're not going to fund all these programs but we're and, and all these institutions, but we're still going to have them. It's just, oh, you, uh, that, that, that's not going to help. It's just uh, crippling something that already doesn't work and make it work even less. It's just, no, restructure. That's what you're going to do. If you're going to play that game, you can do that, restructure some stuff. Anyways, let's go back to what she has to say. Actually, the Icelandic public has placed integrity, transparency, value-oriented oriented policies and competence very high on the political agenda. However, we've had numerous political scandals. Some of them have received world attention. And in my mind, maybe this is all part of a necessary catharsis as we get to grips. Yeah. We've had a lot of political scandals. Some of them have perhaps re received worldwide attention. Every scandal the radical left uh, in Iceland wants uh, wants to get uh, international worldwide attention gets it. <laughs> uh, they're very lucky with that. It also goes back to the fact that they're very, very good at politicking. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so we're now, I've uh, been talking about a scandal that they want to bury and, uh, you know, that stretches stretches into her ministry and that isn't getting much attention uh, outside of uh, a few media outlets in Iceland trying to pick it up and getting punished uh, heavily in doing so and then myself talking about it a little bit. Uh, so outside of that, it hasn't managed to get a lot of traction. Because, uh, yeah, there are a lot of big, powerful players with ties to the public purse who quite simply do not want that out there. So, uh, yeah. Maybe uh, we should uh, look in the mirror and uh, give herself that part of the speech again. With a new kind of democratic governance. Uh, in the past wonder, decade, ever since the crisis... I wonder what her idea of a new... Democratic Parliamentary elections and even referendums have been unusually frequent in comparison to the preceding 74 years of our republic's history. Uh, I was elected to the Icelandic parliament in 2007 and last year, 2017, was, was my fifth election in 10 years' time. So you can see the turbulence, the political turbulence the crisis created. However, the approach has really been, what we have seen in Iceland is that political debate and discussion has become more and more polarized. Mm -hmm. Now I'm leading actually a very broad coalition government from the right to the left. And my view... From the right to the left, again, that's a little bit debatable um, because there is this the center right and they, as a party, when you find them listed and they would say that as well, center right coalition. The independence party which is why they're also a broad coalition and have been the the largest party throughout the country's history because it's a broad coalition of ideas and, and standpoints so it stretches from the center towards the right uh and then the other party is a center they've been center right at times center left at times now very much uh, a center left it's the progressive party doesn't mean the same as progressive in the US sense this is a progressive party in Iceland is kind of a centrist socialist uh, well social democratic maybe uh, it, it is they definitely prioritize collectivism over individualism uh, uh, in most of their uh, policy prescriptions, it seems. And uh, I don't know if they would describe themselves as socially aware, but now today, you know, it's, a, it's the agrarian party, you know, you will, in, in some countries they have agrarian party. So it's unions, it's protecting agriculture um, and uh, making sure uh, farmers and food safety within their own borders is guaranteed, all those kind of things. And they're kind of, those parties are kind of related across borders. 
uh, the same focus points, the same uh, direction, and sort of place themselves uh, in the similar spots each time. So there's protectionism, um, it's, uh, some degree of social conservatism, but economically very, uh, very center left. There's uh, subsidies uh, in there, and at the same time, there's a uh, welfare spending. So yeah, uh, and then her party is uh, is very much you know would be what you'd call the uh, the, the, the most far left of the progressive arm uh, in the US and several other countries. So if you look at it that way, the coalition, because it goes center right within one party and then it has a lot of center left and, and extreme left, it's, it's very, uh, you know, it's a gray area to say that it stretches from the right to the left. Uh, it stretches from the center right to the, the, the left, but it's, uh, you look at the overall coalition, I would say it's uh, the coalition as a whole would be a center left at, at best. Or my take on this is that we need to be very utilitarian. We need to focus on having less polarizations and a more holistic view in building up the public infrastructure in order to re also build up the public trust. So she said a whole bunch of nothing there. Okay, so holistic view, um, what do you mean? And being more utilitarian, again, what do you mean? And uh, and when you're gonna be, this is this is the scariest word I ever hear a politician say, utilitarian, because uh, everything uh, everything in, in uh, terms of uh, tyranny, in terms of dictatorships. In terms of uh, imperialist expansion, and there's a lot of utilitarianism there. It's very utilitarian. If uh, if a if you're ten people in a boat, this is the analogy I often use. Uh, if you're ten people in a boat and it's sinking, and uh, you have to you, you can't save everybody, so you have to get uh, one person off the boat to be able to keep it afloat till help comes. Um, who are you gonna pick? It might be very utilitarian to pick the one who is least capable of, you know, holding his hat or bucket or whatever and get the water off the boat uh, to, to keep it from sinking completely. Maybe, yeah, if you pick the, the least capable, the least fit and able person there uh, to help keep the boat afloat till help manage to, manages to reach you, yeah, it's very utilitarian. But that also means that, uh, you know, you, you, you may have just uh, killed a disabled guy, you know? or less able person. So, so yeah, so it's a very dangerous idea, utilitarianism. So, uh, so whenever I hear a politician say that we have to be utilitarian, I'm just like, what do you mean by that? And it is not without good reason that I ask that because this is a dangerous word in, in power and politics, dangerous word. And uh, yeah, you know, for that matter, you're in a boat, you could sacrifice somebody and what are you going to do? Take his guts and like stuff them in the hole so the boat stops leaking? Again, very utilitarian, but what the, the outcome of that is that you have nine people deciding to sacrifice one pe person for the sake, sake of the hole, uh, for the sake of the other nine. So yeah, I mean, granted, it's not good if none of them survives. That's That's the worst outcome. It's always better than that nine people survive than none. But when you have the nine people who chose for some reason over another to sacrifice the tenth person for their own gain, then yeah, you might want to look at motives and morality and and uh, approach there. What the thinking is. So when somebody gives you, you the word utilitarian, find out what they think. What are they thinking? in that moment you, you really want to know that for the sake of not just yourself but everybody i think really the lessons we can learn is that politicians have to be humble and responsible as it is a privilege to be given an opportunity to shape the present and the future of the nation but at the same time we must remember it's a huge responsibility to steer our society in extremely challenging times so to restore trust, we should embrace and promo promote wide-ranging changes in our political practices. And I think part of that is what Mr. Guria mentioned here. It's not only about 
trust. It's not only about being humble, even though that's very important, but also face the fact that we need to think about the public as a whole. We need to build up the public infrastructure. And part of the trust in Iceland, or the trust problem in Iceland, is that the economic recovery, which has been remarkable, hasn't been equally divided, as Mr. Guria mentioned. Okay, so yeah, so she says all these nice things, and uh, yeah, it is, you know, a politician should be humble and, res you know, responsible and all that. Then she gives us a whole this whole stick again about uh, how we need to build up the public as a whole and public infrastructure. What so what do you, what do you in specifically in detail? What do you refer to when you say the, this build up the public infrastructure? So I mean, obviously that's a very very furry term because what what public infrastructure? How are you gonna rebuild it? And what is that gonna do? I mean, okay, so you pick this public infrastructure over the other why and, and why is that going to render results why is that going to make things better and and how is it going to make things better than if you would go the other way and uh let's see the same thing with uh what else did i have in mind she's kind of uh, uh kind of dancing around this there little... and that's something that we need to face and do now voters must be given a chance to monitor the readily available information that the author Oh, yeah, now I remember. Sorry, let me let me let her finish this point. Authorities are worthy of the trust invested in them. New methods. So, the voters should be able to monitor politicians that they're worthy of the trust invested in them. Yeah, that is a good start. So, uh, maybe put all the government uh, finances and uh, all government spending, make all of that accessible. Uh, exactly how what's being spent on what and how. And... Uh, and everything that's going on within this behemoth of a structure and streamline it so it's easier for for the public to keep track of what's being done what's being achieved uh and maybe you know i would suggest maybe if you did demand results somewhere for a change that you can actually uh demonstrate and, and show empirically for that people are getting results for what's being spent then that would surely help um and she also mentioned let's see what was oh yeah she went back to the uh oh wait prices uh, i keep wanting to go back to that point but new technology should be employed to enable yeah now i remember that point so the point that she made that kept slipping my mind every time i paused was uh that the uh the gains since 08, because Iceland's been booming for a few years, hadn't been equally distributed. Uh, again, that is a that is a value judgment. This is one of the many things that that uh, just kind of tells us that we have different uh, different wings and views and factions in politics. So uh, many would say, well, if equally distribute it what does that entail does that mean you know and, and how do you measure it equally as in not everybody uh got as rich or equally as in not everybody got as per their output because we have to also realize that not everybody is equal in output be that whether they are incapable or whether they're unwilling you know and both exist which is you know why that is an endless uh it's a never-ending uh conflict and fight and debate when, when people are, are, you know, trying to argue about something that when, when all of it is, uh, is somewhat true at the same time. But yeah, so some people uh, could produce and contribute less than others. And uh, not all of it is because they're lazy, but not all of it is because they're incapable either. There's both exist. So, um, so you can't generalize on that. Uh, uh, and also, yeah, um, when you're when you're saying that uh, and, and stressing that it's not, um, you know, not everybody is benefiting as much as they could be. If you if she would have phrased it, not everybody's benefiting as much as they could be benefiting from the growth. I would actually agree with that statement, because I think uh, I think overall the the society as a whole in Iceland could have benefited a lot more, but a lot of it also has to do with public sector inefficiency. That um, there's a big, huge block of a barrier between the the bottom and the top there. That's called the public sector. 
sits here as a, a huge behemoth that um that makes it you know more uh conflictuous and difficult for for everything for for money to flow for resources to flow for uh resources to go where they're much needed at each given time um it's sort of like um like putting a massive barrier in your internet connection somewhere and all of a sudden you go from broadband to dial up in no time because uh somebody's uh tapping your line and and milking all the bandwidth out of it and that somebody is the uh the, the large and inefficient public sector that is supposed to be granting you giving you larger bandwidth but it's doing the opposite because it's just kind of sitting there and doesn't know what it's doing or, or how to do things or or you know maybe because it's an anti-corruption thing that maybe there's a lot of corruption inside of it as well and uh and it's the, it's the nature of it that's, that's all i'm saying it's and you know if you have a public sector you have institutions that go on for decades and decades and decades and then people go in there and they're they don't get fired they work there for years on end of course they're gonna have hire people they get along with and they're going to build that kind of little cult it's going to be all these tiny petty kingdoms of nepotism inside every institution and it's the inevitable byproduct you'd be better off even and if you're a lefty i'll give you this take every institution scratch it and re-establish it every 15 years and you'll have a lot less corruption a lot more uh effective uh results in your in your even in your big government behemoth you'd be way better off already right there um because yeah it's just the sheer na nature of it uh, anyways let's uh let's go on public engagement and we politicians must learn to live in an environment with constant scrutiny sometimes unfair but sometimes fair criticism is the rule the media should be merciless and small mistakes could lead to resignation which is not very common in iceland actually yeah, no shit. It's not common in Iceland. Uh, small mistakes. Uh, again, I would suggest that she uh, fires that assistant. Um, that, that would be that would surely be a good start. Either that, or at least uh, you know, at least look into it. That's the first thing. Um, and uh... but something that the public uh, public actually calls for. Now, the Nordic countries, as you mentioned, Mr. Guria, are well represented here this morning, and. I know that many regard us as model countries in many respects, but even more so in the turbulent times currently prevailing in the international arena. However, Iceland's story shows that even in the Nordic countries, serious issues with integrity and corruption may exist. Nonetheless, in place is also a very solid fabric and democratic egalitarian tradition, which should help us to overcome such challenges. And I must again the uh, democratic egalitarian tradition which should help us to overcome these challenges in what sense i mean she she doesn't uh she, you know it's just speech she doesn't uh add and she could this is very quick quick and easy to do even in you know yeah you're giving a speech so you're not going to give us every bit of of why this or why that but even you know she could have had half the points that she has and she could have under each and every one of those uh she could have said and here's why and given us three points three sub points to justify why she claims that or how that can be achieved or something something not just uh uh these are our aims a whole bunch of fluffy language and then uh, yeah you know a whole bunch of you panelists go talk amongst yourself and come up with something and never get to know what that is so uh yeah and also the media yeah they should be uh she mentions the media the media should be giving uh politicians a hard time again going back to the daddy two story when you have an assistant to this prime minister you have a vp from another party and you have uh big media journalists all cahooting together inside of this uh group you know you know it's just tough yeah we like, I like the idea of media being all that. I like the idea of media calling out everything, left, right, center, all the time, being super just hawkish on it, but it, um, it's just, it's an ideal of mine. I'm bummed. It's not the reality. Uh, sadly, confirma confirming somebody's confirmation bias, that sells. 
uh, shocking stories, uh, clickbait and, and crazy headlines about uh, the world going to an end and, and, you know, Armageddon cells, but not the things that we actually do well in this world. And we've accomplished quite a bit over the past decades in spite of everything. And we can't celebrate any of it because it's just, it's not a good news story. And this is incredibly sad um, about the media. And then, of course, yeah, people uh, venture into the uh, media field being who they are with their own uh, sets of biases, etc. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's just, it's tough. It's tough to uh, rely on the media. And uh, it's, uh, it's not necessarily... Uh, good business for them and it hasn't been at least good business for them to be honest just and truthful to every story to attack and challenge uh, everyone equally but i'm just hoping in this dire polarized position that the world now finds itself in i'm hoping there's a growing market for it it looks like there is but i'm just hoping the trends keep the trend keeps growing Anyways, let's see if we can get through this, because I know I'm keeping you guys up uh, for a long time here, but I, I hope I'm giving you plenty enough value to justify the time, the length of this video. Anyways. Just add that in Iceland's case, since we are so few, and still uh, in Iceland, you actually, everybody knows each other, which has been part of the problem, because when the banks failed, it, part of the problem was that everybody knew each other, so therefore you could always just pick up the phone and... and yeah, it's just not wrong. Nepotism is a, is very much a problem in small societies. That's why it's hard to get into small societies, be it a small village or a small country. It's very hard to get in. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist in bigger countries. And that's often on a larger scale. And it can be uh, a lot more difficult. Bypass the regulations, the, the small regulations that were. So in our case... The smaller regulations that were, well... According to her subjective judgment, there would be some people who would say, oh, we didn't have enough regulations. Other people would say, well, we had too many regulations and they didn't do us any good anyways. In this case, we have also uh, benefited very much from international cooperation, such as here within the OECD, which has set high standards. Well, not just within the OECD, in general. In general, this country is a huge export nation. This country is a huge import nation. Uh, yeah, Iceland is dependent on global cooperation and global trade, which is why making it look like uh, Icelanders are, uh, are culturally unreliable people because they have a cultural tendency to say, ah, fuck the, fuck the state, fuck society, fuck everybody, I'm not going to pay my taxes, you know, uh, like, as if that is the attitude, making it seem as if that is like a cultural attitude is not good to uh, a country that depends on trade and trust uh, with the world. Also, uh, doing other things that uh, politicians have been very good at lately, uh, like practicing uh, uh, partisan and, and biased uh, uh, stances in international po politics, especially with regards to the UN. Uh, and, uh, you know, some decisions there that uh, do not fall in line with Iceland's history of neutrality uh, when it comes to global affairs. Uh, Iceland's been very much, uh, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a part of NATO um, and it's a part of the EFTA agreement with the EU and a handful of others. Aside from that, um, Iceland has been very consistent about being friendly and on trading and, and friendly terms with uh, everyone, everyone who seeks it. So Iceland's been a uh, friend with the US, Russia and the European Union and uh, it has now recently fallen into uh, this pattern of either siding uh, with policies against Russia, for example, along with the EU and or the US and or the UK in the most recent case. And then uh, when Trump uh, declared Jerusalem to be uh, to be Israel's capital and uh, the UN, several countries lobbied in the UN and got like a motion against the states, Iceland uh, went along with the Nordic Council and the European Union and, and voted on that one when, uh, if you look at the tradition of Iceland's neutrality, a, a neutral position would have made sense. It's a lot. But yeah, uh, Iceland needs, uh, needs its global partnership. And guides, uh, guided us relentlessly in the right direction. 
Last, uh, lastly, uh, in the issues concerning tax evasion, which were actually a very big scandal in Iceland two years ago, but with the cooperation in, within the OECD, we actually managed to get a political consensus on process when it comes to tax evasion, and we have made great progress in that area, which I'm very proud of being uh, coming from Iceland and leading a new government there. So th okay, so what's the problem? If you're getting a consensus, you're getting uh, progress on that, then what is the problem? Okay. Now, if, if the country was culturally as bad as she say, say, says, then, you know, she probably wouldn't be. Well, you know, unless, of course, she's going to say, oh, the only reason for why we changed on, on that front is the lessons of 08. We learn. Which, you know, again, this is, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of subjective opinion in there. There's a lot of uh, um, will and inclination to dictate the narrative and to, uh, to basically direct the narrative and just keep that accepted uh, status quo. But there's not a lot of un uh, substance that she's, she's not using a lot of substance or, or points to back up any of what she's saying. And, and this is precisely the problem. You know, you get some political factions or groups or movements, be they from the light, right, left, center, wherever. You get those political groups who uh, manage to win big at some point and they get the momentum, they get all the microphones, and they make sure they steer everything in the public perception and uh, everything in the narrative in the direction they wanted to go and needed to go. And then they just keep repeating that, repeating it. And the more often they repeat it, the more often, you know, the, the more you'll start to think it's true. And uh, it's just about repeating it, uh, repeating it until you make it true, even though it isn't true. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, there's just uh, so much missing here. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be here with you. And I hope this forum will be successful, fruitful, and guide us in the right direction. Thank you. So yeah, anyways, uh, that was that. And that was my uh, way too long a breakdown on what I felt that was missing, and uh, where I questioned what she said, and, uh, the details. And also another great reason for why I'm making this video and I'm, I'm dissecting her speech is that uh, overall I just uh, don't feel like she did the country justice by the way she opened and painted the picture of the nation and the history in the beginning. Um, I don't th believe that that inspires trust in people, which is why I, <laughs> I got into the hot seat myself. I, uh, I started a change.org uh, petition, a motion <laughs> after, after the first time I saw this thing. Um, uh, because of how I felt about it. And, uh, yeah, um, there's just uh, there's a lot to it here. But uh, yeah, I don't think the uh, speech was uh, good for the country or the public or the uh, international foreign affairs interests, which is what the petition was about. I should probably link it, although it's all in Icelandic. Uh, it was uh, a challenge to the uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs to look into this speech and uh, and how it may or may not be affecting our uh, our brand and our, our foreign uh, global interests. Um, so yeah, there's that. And uh, this is also what happens when you get to just craft and drive the narrative and you get to be unchallenged, virtually unchallenged as you do so. This is exactly what happens. Anyways, that's enough for now. Viking out.